There they there are. are. It looks good. Okay, continue. We're going to start at about two minutes after. So. Well, I just wanted to add that I got the info about CBS and um, Walgreen from an article in the New York Times talking about that those two pharmacies have been selected and then naming the 27 states that will be included. And I assume that's a, a federal distribution, but sure. uh, Iowa is not part of Walgreens or CVS going and, forward. And, and I will, I will con the person who um, is at the state health department kind of overseeing the mechanisms told me that Walgreens in fact was using the leftover long-term yeah. care supply as you had heard. So right. that may be where my wife and I were able to get in uh, through that kind of, I, I forget how many doses there were through that yeah. particular supply. Well, good. I'm glad you got it. I'm glad you did oh, it. Yeah, that's just oh, luck, yeah. though. That, that is. Oh well. Ernie, what's, what, what's your sense of this uh, other, uh, the smaller pharmacy or the pharmacy organization that the governor's talking about? Do you? There's quite a number of independent pharmacies throughout the state of Iowa that belong to that network, and so now they're being included. Uh, I don't know anything about uh, the state of the distribution of the vaccine to those pharmacies at this point. And of course, you know, that's, that's one of the limiting factors. I think another limiting factor with CVS and Walgreens is staffing. Um, they're pretty staffing challenged all the time. And um, so that can be a limiting factor. And they were chosen to do uh, all the nursing home um, uh, vac vaccinations. And uh, so that was the first part. And I think they pretty well wrapped that up. It'll be gradually opened up to the public. You know, there's a phase 1A and then a, a phase 1B. And what makes this really complex, then within phase 1B, there are five tiers. And so you have to work your way through all those tiers. Yeah. Uh, at Towncrest, uh, uh, through through the public health department, that they, they do all the scheduling for Towncrest Pharmacy, and um, so so far Towncrest has been doing uh, EMTs, uh, the sheriff's department, uh, physicians' offices and clinics. Um, They've gone out to some of the clinics and then a lot of the staff from the clinics have been coming to the pharmacy. And Barb, you need to get started. That is right, Bernie. Thank you for that perfect cue, yeah. right on target. Well, great. Thank you all for joining. Um, welcome to the meeting of the Iowa City Noon Rotary. My name is Barb Thomas and I'm your president for this year. And as you just witnessed, a lot of members are actually logging into the meeting a little bit early, up to 15 minutes in advance, to just talk about some of these various issues around the COVID vaccine in that we know there's a lot of information, sometimes not enough information, and that if you are interested in gaining some insight, we just welcome you to log in a little bit early, and that way you can learn um, a little bit more from your fellow members. However, I will draw your attention to the chat because thanks to Tricia Smith from the United Way, she's providing a lot of information in the chat about various options for vaccination. So if this is of concern for you, and it probably should be for all of us, please check the chat so that you can learn a little bit more. So when we start our meetings, we always start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you're able to, please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all.
Great, thank you all. And uh, welcome to the, set, to the top floor of the Thomas household. It might look a little different. Um, and it's simply because I've been in the basement in the guest bedroom for an awful long time. And guess what? It's really cold down there. And so this week I had like this amazing brainstorm. Why it took me this long, I have no idea. But I realized that perhaps it would be warmer if I moved upstairs. So I'm in my son's bedroom. It's a little drab and there's no place for me to hang the rotary banner. So, you know, so be it, but hey, I'm warm. So, so with that, I want to turn it over quickly to Kelly Drown, who's helping us run the meeting today for a few Zoom tips. Kelly? Perfect. Thank you, President Barb. So this isn't any new information, but as Barb mentioned, just a quick reminder, please remember to mute your microphones. It just helps with taking out any of that unnecessary background noise so we can all hear. Also, um, when you are, if you happen to have a guest, um, you will use the participant um, uh, little box down there to raise your hand. And you can also use that during the presentation of the speaker, should you have any questions. Um, we do recommend at this point in time when we're all kind of visiting and, and saying hello to be in the gallery format, that you can uh, hit the button in the top right hand corner. But as soon as our speaker starts to go ahead and um, put it on speaker view. It just allows you to have a much better uh, view of the speaker and especially when they have slides as well. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to President Barton. Great, thank you very much, Kelly. And just a reminder to everyone, it's helpful if you can mute your microphone, which if you're on a PC should be in the bottom left for you. Um, and then we will give you that opportunity to introduce your guests. So this is the time to practice those Zoom tips. Go to the participants tab and raise your hand. And then Kelly will call on you to introduce your guests. And I know that Kelly has a couple of guests herself. So I do. Kelly, you. I'll go ahead and start with that then so then I can help monitor the, the hand raising. So my guests today are two of my colleagues with the University of Iowa Center for Advancement. And Matt and Cole, if you would like to unmute your microphones and uh, turn on your cameras and say hello. Hello, Kelly. Hello, everyone. My name, like Kelly said, is Matt Kuster. I am a, a fundraiser for the University of Iowa College of Engineering and excited to join you today over in this noon hour. Thanks, Matt and Cole. Greetings, everybody. My name is Cole Bowermaster. I am um, a member of the development team for the College of Engineering and excited to join everybody from Cedar Falls. Thanks for joining us, Cole. All right. I also know that uh, Nancy Quellhorst has a guest today. Hi, Kelly. I do have a guest. My guest is Brent Carstensen, who's joined us quite a few weeks before. And uh, so I'm pleased that he's here with us again. And uh, before we ask Brent to say hello, I just want to say congratulations on your engagement. Yeah. So happy for you. you. Thank you so much. All right, Brent, would you like to say hello? Sure. I'm happy to be with you again this week and uh, enjoy the meetings immensely. Thank you well, for having me. Thanks for joining us. Um, Dean Julie Zurowick, you have a guest today. So my guest is actually going to be our speaker next, um, Dr. Harriet Nemhart. Great. Harriet, I will pass it on to you once we've finished with the guest and we'll have you do a, a, a larger introduction. So um, John Cutchall, you have a guest today. Hi everybody. Um, my guest today is Russ Gannam. Russ is the Dean of International Programs and Associate Provost. And I guess we better be careful or we're going to have a quorum of the Council of Deans here if we don't look out. So uh, glad Russ is with us again. So glad to have him here. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me back. It's always a pleasure. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us, Russ. All right. With that, um, any other uh, guests or visiting Rotarians. I do know that we have Gary Wickland as a visiting Rotarian. Welcome. All right. All right, Barb, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thanks so much, Kelly. And John, I think you are right. I did invite Amy Christoph Brown 
to attend who is not attending so far. So if she does come, the deans are taking over. I'm just saying, okay, so. Do you need, do you need us to help pressure? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be a good example for her to see Harriet present because I'd like Amy to present down the road. So um, who knows, she might pop in a little bit, so. Great. Um, a few announcements before we get moving with our presentation today. I did want to kind of put a challenge out to everyone in our club. Next Wednesday, February 17th, is Random Acts of Kindness Day. So I want you to think about it. What are you going to do? Are you going to buy Starbucks for the guy behind you? Are you, you know, if you're one of those deans, are you going to go buy a cup of coffee at one of the coffee shops for a student? What are you going to do for some random stranger next Wednesday? Mark your calendar. The challenge is on Random Act of Kindness Day. I also want to make sure that everyone is aware that Rotary International is presenting a diversity webinar on exploring the Black experience in Rotary. It is on February 25th at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. I will try to put the information on that webinar in the chat. If you are interested, I you know, highly recommend it. I have registered. And then in addition, I also wanted to put something out to our committee chairs that um, if you are looking for more involvement in your committee at a district level, you do have the opportunity to participate in what is called NC PETS. And PETS is President-Elect Training Seminar, I believe. And what that does, that's a couple of days conference and it's all will be virtual this year, but it brings together all of the presidents and the president elects and the president elect nominees. And so at this conference, they have what they call the house of friendship. And it's basically like an expo center, but they will be doing it virtually this year. And this would be a good opportunity for your committee if you wanted bigger district involvement to get involved and have a presence at the virtual house of friendship. If you're interested in that, please reach out to me and I will send you that information. So that's it for my announcements, but I do see that Vern Folkman has an announcement. Vern? Thank you, President Barb. Um, I do, and I have a great pleasure of doing that because I'm the, the chairman of the foundation committee. And so if any of our members give uh, money to the foundation, I, I get notified and, and I, I like to honor those people. And today we have a, uh, a Paul Harris Fellow plus five. So that means that this person has given $6,000 total to the foundation so far. And I think she's working her way toward the Paul Harris uh, Society, which would be 10,000. So uh, that, that person is Brenda LaMarche and I think she's with us today. So Brenda, would you like to say a few words about why you feel Rotary is a good place to put your money? Sorry, I had to unmute. I, I actually didn't even realize I've gotten to that level. The one cool thing about uh, having auto deduction and auto contributions on a monthly basis is, you know, you set it and you forget it. So hint for those of you that uh, contribute to Rotary, set it and forget it. Works great. Um, I actually started participating in Rotary because my mother had polio when she was in her 20s and it affected her her entire life. And I found Rotary to be personally valuable to me as an organization with, with all of the programs and opportunities to be able to make the world a better place as a whole. So that's why I participate with Rotary. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. Let's give her a big hand. All of us. There we go. Thanks, uh, Barb, for letting me do that. You bet. Thanks so much, Vern, for sharing that news. And thank you, Brenda, for everything that you do for Rotary. So uh, before we move to our program, uh, we are going to visit with Janice Baldus. And we're going to go to Janice because she's going to provide for us her Rotary moment of gratitude and positivity. Janice? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Barb, for the opportunity to share some thoughts. Um, one of my favorite things to do is share my thoughts. Uh, my husband, Brad, 
did a top 10 gratitude list not that long ago. So I thought it, I would be his wingman and I would be his yin to his yang and I'm gonna do my top 10 positivity list. So in no particular order, some things that I'm feeling really positive about. The first businesses are gaining efficiencies and there's no greater example than the DOT and changing to an appointment model versus a free for all. It's so quick. I was in and out yesterday in 10 minutes getting my real ID taken care of and the online scheduling makes it a breeze. Number two, it's time to dust off and tackle the nagging punch list. Last weekend, I repaired some throw pillows and blankets and a few other odds and ends that had piled up. And next up are the wall dings that have been staring me down for ages. The last thing that I want is to get to the other side of the pandemic with a punch list still sitting there. And it feels amazing to finally get them whacked and stacked. Number three, the opportunity to love on neighbors as Barb was sharing for next week. So many would have been south in my neighborhood for the winter and helping with some snow clearing, making some cookies or a meal. And I just guarantee if you look around, there's someone that you can love on and there's no better way to do it than Valentine's Day coming up this weekend. Um, number four, the blessing of natural endings. Um, I wanted to try a new hairstylist that opened close to my home. And because of the forced shutdown, I had a natural pause to not have to break up with my old hairstylist and just slide over and try someone new. And in my book, experience something new is super fun. Number five, removing clutter. Clutter is the enemy of creativity and so many of our homes were filled to the brim with years and decades of leftovers and stuff. And judging by the line at Goodwill to drop off your treasures, I know that I was not the only one here today to get in the spirit of less is more. Number six, the ability to pour into our spaces. We're all in our houses a lot more than we ever used to be. And for some of us, it's been 24 seven. So when you stare down the same space for so much time, new possibilities emerge for turning it into one that you love to be in, especially when you have just purged it. And if a space isn't as functional as you would like or doesn't have the feel you want, change it. Number seven, discovering some great TV shows after taking the Netflix plunge. My current obsession is Queer Eye, which is based upon a team of gay professionals, the Fab Five, giving lifestyle and fashion makeovers to the guests and I laugh and I cry every single episode. There's so much love, so many barriers being broken down and healing and people just coming to life again. And it's awesome and a total pick me up. Number eight, learning something new, online classes, apps, technology. It's never been easier to learn something new. Now I must admit the two biggies that I have on my list are to learn Spanish and to play the piano. But I haven't done those, but both have an app. And so I haven't started the Cross the starting line, but I did do some research to find the app, so I'm teed up to take the plunge. And if, so if you've ever wanted to try something new, you can literally do it now right in your home. Number nine, um, hashtag YOLO, you only live once, took on a new meaning. The pandemic created a time to get really intentional about what we want in our lives. And I have a group of friends that are called the Gal Pals. And some have moved away and we just began a weekly Zoom date on Thursday nights and now we can't figure out why we didn't do it sooner. We talk every week or every two weeks and we're closer and more connected than ever. And we've gotten to walk through this huge period in history together instead of disappearing into our own worlds only to emerge on the other side. And number 10, finally humor. So many funny memes and Zoom snafus like the one circulating this week about the lawyer who accidentally has a cat filter on as he is talking to the judge and his face is actually a cat's face. So the eyes and the mouth are moving with his and it's hilarious. And I'm giving it two thumbs up, uh, something you should Google and watch for a good belly laugh later today. So thanks so much for your time and I hope you all have a great day filled with positivity. Great. Thank you so much, Janice. That is a great list. I will agree with you that cat lawyer cat video is hilarious because at one point in time, he clarifies, I am not a cat. <laughs> and he can't figure out how to turn the filter off. So he wants to continue on with the legal um, activity, whatever they're doing as a cat. So be it. So thanks for that. All great moments. And I do, you know, while I did an emphasis on next Wednesday being random act of kindness, strangers, random acts of kindness, 
day to any stranger. Um, Gary Pacha did give me a little nudge and kind of remind me that, frankly, we should probably be doing that just about every day anyway, right? So go ahead, do it today if you want to. I challenge you, do it today, do it tomorrow, but especially do it next Wednesday. So uh, I do want to make sure that you look at the chat, go into the chat, add in your name. That's the way to pay your, do put your attendance in. Um, but you will see some information in there from Tricia Smith about some vaccine information from the United Way as well. So next, I want to go to Tara Manetos. Tara is going to give, um, give us an update. We're going to get to hear from one of our scholarship recipients. Tara, can I turn it over to you for an intro? Thank you, President Barb. Um, I'm super excited. We have a very special guest here today. Sushma Santana is one of our recipients of the Rotarian Supporting Women Scholarship. Um, she is very generously slipping us in between her classes. So she has 12.15 to 12.30, uh, but she is just one of the most enthusiastic supporters of Rotary, which she participated in in her high school. And uh, we can't wait till she is done with classes so she can attend a whole meeting. Uh, but I'll turn it over to you, Sushma. Yeah, hi, can you guys hear me? We can. Okay. okay, cool. So as she said, my name is Sushma Santana and I am a freshman at the University of Iowa now and I'm majoring in biomedical engineering and I'm also pursuing an entrepreneurial management certificate and I was lucky enough to receive a scholarship from this Rotary Club. And first and foremost, I wanted to extend a big thank you to you guys because scholarships have such a positive impact on college students like me. Personally, it shows me that you guys like recognize the things that we're doing and you see our achievements and you believe in us moving forward. And for me especially, it motivates me to work harder and succeed because generous people like you are putting their trust in me. And also because of scholarships, I have more time to focus on getting involved in other things because I don't have to worry as much about like where's the money coming from that I can pay for college. So I've been able to get involved in lots of different activities such as dance marathon, um, a biomedical engineering student society. And I've also taken up a undergrad research position in the orthopedic biomechanics lab. Um, so yeah, this college experience is a lot different than probably what you guys had when you were here. A lot of my friends don't leave their dorms all day. They'll only just like walk out of their rooms to get food and then come back maybe. Um, and we, this semester, there are a couple more in-person classes than there was last semester. I have like two once a week, otherwise everything is Zoom and completely online. And a lot of people used to like complain about having to get up and go to class, but I get really excited now when I get to go to a classroom and see everyone and just like be in other people's company now with my roommates. Um, and also it's kind of funny. We just know everybody through like the screens and like just what their like screen names are, but Sometimes you'll have like a rare sighting of your teacher in person and you're like, oh my gosh, you're my teacher, you're real, you're not across the screen, but um, it's kind of funny like that. Anyways, um, hopefully I'll be able to go to more classes in person and you guys will all be able to meet together in person again too. And I hope that I'd be able to see you all face to face and not through a screen at some point. But yeah, thanks. Wonderful, thank you, Sushma. And so you're right, we do believe in you and we see great things for your future. So keep it up. It's okay that it's kind of weird. It's a weird year, but you'll get through it and it will get better. And the other thing is, is that did you know that your Dean is our program speaker today? I mean- I saw her in the thing and I was like, wait, I recognize that name. <laughs> exactly. Now I understand you have to go to class. so. Tara will probably send you a link so that you can watch her presentation on our YouTube page. So make sure you do that, but also make sure you get to class, okay? Okay, thank you. Great, thanks so much. So speaking of Harriet, now we will go on to our program and I'm gonna turn it over to Nursing Dean, Julie Zerwick, who will do our introduction today. Julie? Yes, thank you. It's a pleasure to introduce Harriet Nemhard, who is the new 
although not quite so new, Dean of the College of Engineering at the University of Iowa, and she holds the Roy J. Carver uh, Professorship in Engineering. Uh, Dean Nemhard received her PhD and MS in Industrial and Operations Engineering from the University of Michigan. She received her undergraduate degree in management from Claremont McKenna College, and I had to look at where that is. It's actually in Claremont, California. And she's currently serving as an alumna trustee uh, for her alma mater. Um, prior to this appointment at the University of Iowa, she's held a number of academic leadership positions at Oregon State University and Penn State University. Her scholarships in the area of complex systems, and she's been recognized as a fellow of the Institute of Industrial and System Engineers, and she's a fellow of the American Society of Quality. Um, she, throughout her career, she's focused on creating communities that are inclusive in terms of diversity, equity, and equal opportunity, creating an environment of success for all. So her talk today, and I'm really looking forward to it, is engineering for better health, because I think that's a, an issue we've been talking a lot about um, as we've experienced the coronavirus. So Dean Nemhart. Well, thank you, Dean Julie Zerwick, and thank you, President Barbara Thomas, and thank you to all of you Rotary members and guests in the audience today. It is my distinct pleasure, indeed, to share with you on the topic of engineering for better health. I've got about oh, a dozen slides I'll share with you, so let me start my slide deck. Is everyone seeing it now in full screen? Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. So my favorite definition of engineering is that engineers solve problems to address the needs of society and the welfare of humanity. We all are very aware that there are tremendous, tremendous needs for improving human health. As Julie mentioned, I did my PhD in industrial engineering at the University of Michigan. Industrial engineering, in case you don't know, is all about systems, I say, and there are systems to everything. There are systems to making a cake, especially, for example, if you need to make thousands of them for a bakery, to making planes, systems for making planes. So the first 10 years of my academic career, I applied my training to manufacturing systems. Then in 1997, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And even though she had been getting regular mammograms, it went undetected. So after she recovered from treatment, I asked the question that I had been trained to ask, which was, what went wrong with that system? That question launched the next 15 years or so of my work in the healthcare arena. But I'm not talking about my work today. What I want to do today is to take a few minutes to share with you about the work of our College of Engineering to improve human health. I have, as I just about a dozen slides to give you just a peek inside as to what it's like to be a student in our college, although we just heard some of that from, from our scholarship awardee. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a few of the specific problems our engineering faculty are exploring in improving surgery and detecting illness and building better medical devices. Then I want to share a little bit about how larger teams of people are working in our college to do things like clean up toxins in schools across the country, engaging in health outreach around the globe, and serving the community right here in Iowa, all through engineering for better health. So one of the things that I think is very important to know about our college is that we are a small college of distinction, especially compared to our Big Ten peers. We have about 100 faculty, about 
2,000 undergraduate students and 240 grad students. In 2018, after a period, a prior period of about six years where our undergraduate enrollment expanded by about 70%, an annex addition was completed that provided the space we need for uh, classrooms, labs, offices. Oh, and there's my picture, there was a delay. Um, this annex provided really the high quality facilities that we needed. They um, spark creativity. They are, there are different labs to engage students in engineering, and they certainly attract a top faculty in general. On one floor of the annex, there is uh, a wing dedicated to the Roy J. Carver Department of Biomedical Engineering. We just heard from a student from that department. It's the only named department outside the Carver College of Medicine. And it is the largest department in our college and certainly anchors our footprint in the healthcare space. We have a total of six academic departments and eight research centers and all of them are engaged in engineering for better health in one way, shape or form. The wonderful thing about our College of Engineering, or a wonderful thing about our College of Engineering is that it's right across the river from the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics. When I was at Penn State and starting my work in healthcare systems engineering and starting the center there, Penn State Hershey is about 100 miles away from the main campus. And so there are many times where I was making that trek across the mountains. And here, we just need to cross the river. This has led to easy access and many wonderful collaborations with our colleagues in medicine, nursing, dentistry, pharmacy, and public health, as well as other parts of campus. Our students are among the top academic achievers at the university. They're ambitious, they're enterprising, and they have a faculty that is so dedicated to engaging them in the excitement of research and innovation. About 20% of all undergraduate students have opportunities to work directly with a faculty member in their lab. Here you see students in a lab for a course in cell biology for engineers. This course gives them an introduction to the fundamental principles of cellular environments with a particular emphasis on what's needed for engineering applications, such as designing systems and material that direct cells to regenerate healthy functional tissue. For those suffering from degenerative diseases, Alzheimer's and ALS, this is certainly pointing the way for knowledge and innovation. Graduate students in our college are really trained to be professional partners in research innovation. Right away, they become involved in work to push the boundaries of knowledge through experimental and computational methods. So for example, this graduate student is working on the biomechanics of soft tissues. This area brings together the principles in biomechanics, biomaterials, and medical imaging to study diseases of the cardiovascular and pulmonary systems and devices used to repair them. In short, that team is developing tools for plumbing the body. Our um, Cutting edge research, as I said, is done in many areas, but certainly anchored by the Department of Biomedical Engineering. So Suresh, Professor Suresh Raghavan has developed biomaterials for use in vascular grafts for coronary bypass surgery or cabbage. So during a cabbage, a healthy artery or vein from the body is connected or grafted to the blocked coronary artery. Professor Raghavan's biomaterials has been engineered, they've been engineered to interact with the biological systems in a more effective way. And this technology has already been licensed and commercialized by Medical 21. Professor Sarah Vigmastad, who's also in the biomedical engineering department, 
has developed this unique technology for single cell sequencing and cancer diagnosis. She has a startup company called CinderBio that's pursuing this work. And their patented technology can quickly clean up a sample without the use of biochemical labels and have a sample ready in just 10 minutes. As I said, we have faculty expertise in health in other departments as well. Professor Mona Garvin and her team in electrical and computer engineering are developing automated approaches for assessment or severity of uh, for optic disc swelling. So traditionally what would happen is that a series of fundus photographs, so those serial photographs that are taken for the interior of the eye through the pupil, which are on the top row there, those would typically be used for a qualitative assessment. Just those pictures would be looked at qualitatively. Well, Professor Garvin has developed developed an algorithm to slice the OCT test images in a way that really amplifies those differences. So in the second and third row, you can see that the assessment of the differences in the swelling are much easier to see and detect. Professor Alan Guyman and his team in chemical and biochemical engineering are working on photographing anti-scarring coatings. Photographing is a technique that's used to study polymers and polymeric biomaterials. It uses light to blend additives in that modify the biomaterial surface. And in this case, the coating they used on cochlear implants results in better hearing. The Iowa Superfund Research Program is funded by the National Institutes of Health to address toxic chemicals in the environment. Professor Carrie Hornbuckle is leading a team of about 20 faculty and research scientists and more than 20 trainees from the Colleges of Engineering, Public Health, Pharmacy, Medicine, and the Graduate College. That team is focusing on airborne polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs. These are a set of chemicals that were banned from sale in the 1970s. There's still a because they were used in such large quantities and in so many different industrial and construction materials that they are very resistant to decay. This team is looking at the PCBs released from the Superfund sites around the country and released from materials such as caulking that are found in schools and in ballast that are found in schools. And the team is now solving problems and answering vital questions about the sources, the human exposures, the toxicity, and the remediation of PCBs. They are prioritizing the most important contributors to human health risk. Our engineering work for the common good is a priority. For example, Professor Hans Johnson and his team in electrical and computer engineering have worked alongside volunteers from the Haiti Community Health Initiative. CHI is a nonprofit that's working to improve sustainable health care in Haiti. The team's goal has been to create robust, efficient hardware and software systems that will advance CHI's mission to provide data driven, evidence based health care. Professor Tom Casavant regularly builds teams that span electrical and computer engineering and biomedical engineering where he has a dual appointment. In this case, his team has developed the International Clubfoot Registry. This registry consolidates patient information gathered from clinics and hospitals around the world and standardizes the types of information that is gathered from clubfoot patients. In terms of community, our faculty, staff, and students really get engaged. Our National Advanced Driving Simulator, or NADS, is known around the world for driving research to improve road safety. And I would encourage you, by the way, to read the recent feature article in the Iowa Magazine about the work of this center. It was really just tremendous. 
But one of the ways they pay it forward is to take their many simulators to middle and high schools around Iowa to teach kids about road safety. The Get Out the Lead campaign, which was part of our Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, offered free test kits to Iowans outside of Johnson County so that they can measure the levels of lead in their homes drinking water. These faculty, graduate students and undergraduate students got out there and provided the outreach and education on how to reduce exposure to this toxic heavy metal. Last March, early in the course of the pandemic, when the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics put out the call for additional face shields, the College of Engineering jumped to help out. Our students, faculty, and staff spent a week in our engineering machine shop making more than 1,000 face shields. It was a small thing in the overall scale, scale of the problem, but it was especially gratifying to see that our facilities, equipment, and skills could contribute at that pressing time. Similarly, one of our faculty, Professor Fatima Tour in electrical and computer engineering, got a call from her colleague who was an emergency physician at Mercy. Mercy Hospital had acquired that UV sterilization system, but wanted to be sure that the system was properly irradiating the masks. She went over using one of her specialized thermal sensors to measure the amount of UV exposure needed to properly decontaminate the protective masks. That same project also measured the variation of the UV dose across the physical space so that they could determine the best location to put the masks when exposing them to UV. You know, anytime that there is uh, a national emergency on, uh, in science or engineering, the National Science Foundation and other, other federal funding agencies will put out what are called a call for rapid proposals that are reviewed and awarded with a very quick turnaround. Faculty in our college responded and six of these such awards were made to our college across everything from nursing triage to how students are responding to remote learning to abilities to monitor viruses on hard surfaces. You know, each year we are so proud that some of our students decide to pursue medical degrees. Some of them go right here to the Carver College of Medicine, but have been admitted to schools, top schools and universities across the country. Another aspect that we really emphasize is the placement of our student in, students in healthcare industries. Our alum are very engaged. This fall, or I'm sorry, this term, we are excited to have many of them participate in a virtual career fair that is uh, paying this forward to our current students and helping them to be placed uh, in careers after graduation. Our overall placement rate for our graduates is about 97% within six months of graduation. So I will close just by reminding us that the future of healthcare requires innovation. It does not all happen in hospitals. In the mm -hmm. College of Engineering, we right. have a, in the College of Engineering, we have a track record of success in healthcare research that spans over 40 years. And in just the past five years, we've conducted healthcare related research with funding from of over $23 million with grants from NIH, EPA, FDA, NSF, and many others. We're leading the first stage of a $1 million NIH grant now on AI for medical imaging and are focused on fostering new collaborations with faculty in medicine, public health, and nursing. So with that, I'll close. I thank you so much for your attention and would be happy to receive your comments or questions. 
Great, thank you so much, Harriet. We truly appreciate it. So if people have questions, you can feel free to raise your hand in the participants button um, and then we'll call on you. I did have just a quick question. What's your overall enrollments within the College of Education or Engineering? I know you have undergrads, you have graduates, you know, there's lots of different pools, kind of like the Tippy College of Business. Um, yeah, we have about 2,000 undergraduates and about 240 graduate students. So um, relative to other colleges of engineering, particularly those in the Big Ten, we are a pretty small college. Uh, it has certain benefits, though, as I said, of being a really tight-knit community uh, and just a wonderful community spirit among the faculty and students. Great. Again, I'm just kind of looking for any other questions that might be out there for Harriet. Come on, folks. I know you've got some. Um, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges that the College of Engineering will be facing in the next five years? Well, certainly being able to uh, train the next generation and do this type of innovation requires a top faculty. When I was giving my all hands on meeting for the industrial advisory boards for the various departments and centers around the college, someone asked me, you know, what's the one thing and that I would want to do over the next five years. And really that if I were to, um, it all is very interconnected. It's a system. But the one thing that I would point to is that over the next five years, we will have to be well served in recruiting, I think, at least another 10 to 12 faculty to our college. And, you know, this is a very intensive endeavor. It's very competitive and requires a significant investment. Uh, so hint, hint to my development officers that are on the call here today as well. That's great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that additional information. Um, as somebody who works in academia, I do know that, you know, hiring and top level faculty is a high priority and it's not a cheap endeavor. Um, you know, especially as Iowa City and the University of Iowa strives to become a more diverse organization. That means that recruiting faculty takes a lot more work. Um, and that it's a, it's a lot more challenging to kind of, to attract different people to our community. And so I applaud you and your development officers for your work on that. I do wanna call attention to the chat as well. Bill Easton, who is a member of our club and also a part of the College of Engineering has provided a link for some of the enrollment and demographic information. So if you wanna get a better idea of what uh, what that population looks like. I highly recommend you take a look there. Um, I ha do have another question. It's about like laboratories and the laboratory experience, which has got to be so important for engineering students, but now you're in a time of COVID. So how have your faculty had to work with their, you know, like, especially the clinical hands-on experiences for your students. How has that adjusted? What have you had to do to make sure that that experience is still available, but is safe? Right, right. That has been another uh, tremendous lift for us. And I am so grateful for an amazing team uh, in leadership of our associate dean, Nicole Grossland for um, student affairs and programs, as well as our director and chief technology officer for the IT implementations, because that is what a lot of it has relied on. We spent a tremendous uh, effort and investment in building out uh, videos and taking up close, you know, high quality videos of labs sending lab kits to students' homes. Our uh, Lichtenberger Engineering Library has made these materials available at no cost or barrier for students, uh, but our faculty had to redesign courses, labs for these sort of home lab kits, new videos and uh, computer connectivity. Some machines can be computer controlled from homes or from a farther distance within the engineering space. But this has been uh, a tremendous lift. We've heard from the students that, you know, 
positive feedback, certainly. Many of them appreciate the ability to go back and review labs or review videos, um, do things on uh, an synchronous basis for their convenience. Yes, it's true. But at the same time, we all know that as much as we have tried to make these accommodations, it's not the same. And we're all very much looking forward to returning to in-person classes fully in the fall. Oh, I'm sure you are, especially for the laboratory work. It's just got to be crucial to like really do it, you know, to really get your hands in to see what happens. So I'm going to turn it over to Kelly Drown, who has a question. Kelly? Welcome again, Dean Nembhard. Um, That was wonderful. And certainly we're thrilled to have you at, at the University of Iowa and part of our community. Now that you've been here for some time, obviously during, during a very challenging time, is there anything that has surprised you about the Iowa City community? Oh, what a good question. You know, I don't know if I will categorize it as surprise, but I will say, uh, first acknowledge that it is an extremely challenging undertaking to get to know a couple few hundred people around uh, my college and campus, primarily over Zoom. We've had a couple of in-person meetings. I think Julie and I managed to do a, a quick social distance lunch uh, last summer or before classes started. We've had a couple of meetings that way. Uh, but it certainly has been a challenge to you know, build connections and build relationships in, 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 in this way. Um, but the, I will say a nice surprise, although I'm not actually surprised, but it certainly has been gratifying um, the degree to which people have been uh, nevertheless kind and considerate with their time, you know, gracious and reaching out and saying hello and, and um, you know, making, uh, making sure that both uh, myself and my husband, who's also on the faculty here, he has a joint appointment in the College of Engineering and the College of Business, uh, are very welcome to the academic community. Wonderful. Well, we're thrilled to have you. So thank you. Thank and thanks you. for sharing your time with us today. Of course, of course. Great. Uh, it looks like we have a question. I believe that's Tita Kaufman. Tita? I think you're muted, Tita, both your video and your microphone. Here you are. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I saw the uh, percentages of your students and I see that women represent 28% of your uh, student uh, enrollment. And I was wondering if that percentage has been increasing or is that a number that has remained stagnant? Thank you. Yes, um, we have been very engaged as a college to work on diversity across, uh, across the respects. Women in engineering uh, around the university, I believe, or around the country are at about 20% of engineering students. We're doing a little better than that at about 25 to 28% mostly driven by the women enrollment in the, in the uh, Carver Department of Biomedical Engineering, which is nearly at parity, nearly at parity now with uh, the number of women undergrads enrolled there. This is not the case in other departments. Uh, Department of Civil and Mechanical Engineering are both around 10%-ish. Uh, and then we have some that are more towards that average uh, industrial engineering and, um, and electrical, actually our electrical engineering department does pretty well also compared to national averages of about 20% women there. Excellent, keep up the good work. Keep getting Working those women it. in engineering. So next we're gonna go to Jim Scott, who has a question as well, Jim. Yeah, I just wondered, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. I just wondered, what are the uh, financial rules or regulations if a faculty member gets a patent on a new uh, invention or device? Uh, now this, um, when I was, I will speak from my personal experience. I don't know all of the, the policies and procedures here on, on IT, but when I was working at Penn State, um, a team and I developed a, 
a patent for a device for minimally invasive surgery. And in that case, we had assistance from the university for the patent filing, which is very expensive. So that was an investment uh, and an agreement made with the university. And I don't recall the exact percentages, but we would share in any financial income from that future use of the patent. In that case, I will say um, that patent was not wildly financial, you know, financially lucrative, but you know, others, others certainly are. And I do think that when the university has been involved and when there have been uh, resources put into the research, there is an agreement that's typically worked out by the, the vice president for research office. Uh, beyond that, I would really have to look into more details about how that's typically done here. But the intellectual property does, um, you know, does remain if it's done under university auspices, the, it's the property of the university, but there often are share agreements that aren't established. Got it. Thank you very much. And again, thanks to Bill Easton, who in the chat has provided more information, which includes a list of patents by current faculty and staff from the College of Engineering. So we'll go for one last Thank question you, Bill. To, to Chris Acheson. Chris? Hi, and uh, welcome, Dean uh, Neighboring. I, I used to be the director of the State Hygienic Lab. And when you mentioned laboratories, it really came to my attention. Of course, uh, Carrie Hornbuckles worked with them quite a bit. Uh, but uh, given the COVID outbreak, there are two major issues. One, systems designed to integrate the public and private laboratories into a more effective system. And secondly, information system design. And we're all familiar with the data challenges that seem to be marking just the vaccine distribution, let alone the reporting of information. I've always thought that the University of Iowa and the College of Engineering specifically had tremendous capabilities that could help the state uh, better address some of these management issues. What has to happen in order for that, that tap to be uh, opened? Yeah, you know, you, you, you have a good point. Um, and this type of community outreach and engagement and service is a part, an important part of, of who we are. Um, the primary mission is going to be on educating the students, of course, and, and working on the, the um, research innovations. This sort of application or applied work of how do you make improvements and, and integrate a system, it's rare for that really to fall under, you know, the auspices of an academic institution, pro, you know, specifically. Mm -hmm. But I would think that bringing people together who would have an interest in that outcome of, of just a better integrated system to build the expertise and to, to think about how we could um, perhaps get the ball rolling and energize such an integration, that certainly is something that, that can happen. But, you know, typically it does take those um, you know, those, those real soldiers who are dedicated to that cause to really rally everyone together and, and, and get, um, you know, get a lift such as that. But, you know, I certainly do recognize the need. We do have a very uh, patchwork and disparate system. Um, and there would be people with expertise to contribute to that work in the future. Great. Thank you so much, Dean, for spending the time with us today. So in honor of your talk with us today, our club will actually make a donation to Rotary International's Polio Plus program in your name. And so that donation will be matched two to one by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And in the end, we'll provide 70 vaccinations um, of polio around the world. So happy to do that in your name as a thanks for you spending the time today. That is tremendous. I thank you so much. And it was really a pleasure to be with this group. Well, you're welcome back at any point in time. So I do see we have one more hand raised. Bill, do you have a quick addition at all? Yeah, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. I know there's so much to uh, talk about. So Dean Nemhard probably, uh, you know, she has a lot to talk about, but 
uh, part of the Iowa um, uh, IHR, the Iowa uh, Hydraulic uh, Organization and the Iowa Flood Center uh, had a big honor today that um, uh, Director Witold Krajewski was uh, elected to the National uh, Academy of Engineering, which is a big honor. And, and I just wanted to say congratulations to him and to Dean Nemhard and the whole college for uh, that honor. Well, thank you. Is VTech here? I don't think he is. Uh, I'm sure he's getting lots of congratulations, but I, I saw that come through uh, Iowa now this morning. And, uh, and I, I know a lot of people are very excited about that. Yes, we all are so very proud of him. We had a meeting this morning uh, with everybody at IHR and we'll certainly look forward to uh, celebrating him uh, appropriately in the fall. Well, there's a lot of great work that's happening at the UI College of Engineering, and I'm sure that will continue with you at the helm. So thanks again for joining us, and you are welcome back to our Rotary Club anytime. We're happy to have all of the deans thank come. You. Thank, you. thank you so much. So with that, I think that calls our meeting to an end. And so if our members would like to, they're welcome to unmute their microphones and join me in the Rotary four-way test. Of all of the things, things that we think, we think say, say, or do, do. Is, is it the, the truth? truth? Is it, is it fair, fair to all, all concerned? concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial, beneficial to all concerned? Thank you all for joining us today. Have a wonderful day. Stay warm um, and do something good for somebody. Random act of kindness, especially Wednesday, but any day you can do that. So thank you all. Great to see you all.